Good day and good evening and good morning and welcome to the Research Collective for Decoloniality and Fashion and our presentation, Practicing Decoloniality and Fashion, the Global Fashioning Assembly 2022. Um, so I'd like to say thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to this um, first and exciting um, presentation Welcome to all of you in, in our Zoom room, but also welcome to all of you who are joining us live and online in the live stream. Um, we're very happy to take some questions in the chat, um, if you'd like to share some questions in the chat. And thank you so much to State of Fashion for this invitation and to Artes to join in and to welcome in Ways of Caring, Practicing Solidarity 2022. My name is Erica Dehoyev. I am joining you from South Africa. Um, and together with Angela Janssen, um, we'll be convening today's session um, around practicing decoloniality. So Angela, I wonder if you would go to the next slide. Just an, an introduction to how we'll um, work today or how we'll share with you today is that we'll start with a, a brief overview of what the Global Fashioning Assembly is and how it came to be. And then we'll be sharing, so I'd like to welcome from New Zealand, Doris DuPont, um, from Kenya, Tepkinboy Mangira, from based in, in London, but um, representing the North African collective, Nada Kuresh, and then Leo Vien from Croatia. So welcome to all of you. We'll be sharing um, your projects and your contributions to the Global Fashioning Assembly. And then we're going to end, and we have a fellow bird. <laughs> uh, we're going to end the session then with a, a broader discussion around some of the key themes that we're exploring today. So perhaps maybe this is a good place to start. And, you know, Angela, maybe the next slide. So perhaps, Angela, as an introduction to the Global Fashioning Assembly, could you maybe start um, this afternoon session by explaining what the Global Fashion Assembly is and how it came about? Yes, thank you, Erica. Thank you so much. And so my name is Angela, and I'm speaking to you from a small little village in between the Netherlands and Belgium. And so I've been noticing some fluctuation on my internet connection. So hopefully the weather stays clear and you can hear me all. I'm also co, um, I just said multitasking because people coming in in the waiting room. So I'm trying to admit them as well. But so yes, the Global Fashioning Assembly is a coalitional gathering beyond institutional, disciplinary, and geographical boundaries that aims to decentralize knowledge creation and sharing regarding fashion. Um, so through the conversation, through the relational, the communal, and the coalitional, and through a radical act of listening across um, race, age, gender, epistemologies, and histories. So the first edition is planned in October of this year with 14 hosting communities from New Zealand, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, India, Kenya, South Africa, Namibia, Egypt, Morocco, Croatia, the Netherlands, Colombia, the United States, and Mexico. The assembly is an online 36 hour live stream and recorded event that follows the sun on its course around the world, starting in New Zealand and ending in Mexico. As the sun moves from one time zone to the next, the hosting of the assembly is passed from one community to the next with a multi-stakeholder program combining online and offline formats. The program is created collectively by different individuals, collectives, and communities across the globe. Underpinning the assembly is a communal and experimental process in terms of collective ideation, decision-making and development. Since October, 2021, we have been holding monthly meetings to experiment with working decentral, collective and collaborative in identifying and inviting hosting communities, defining the overall conceptual framework in planning and budgeting, creating a visual identity, 
communication strategies, as well as identifying funding opportunities in different parts of the world and writing applications collectively. Each aspect of the assembly is self-represented, activated and governed, whereby local stakeholders, communities and audiences are equally engaged and connected across different locations. With guests becoming hosts and hosts becoming guests, conventional colonial power relations often at play in global projects are disrupted. To break with gatekeeping processes based on peer reviewing that decides who gets to speak and whose voices get silenced, whose knowledges get validated and whose not, and to privilege excellence, the host and communities of the assembly have not gone through a selection process, but have been identified and invited collectively through a network of networks. Each hosting community decides on its content, format, and languages according to its specific experiences and practices, struggles, and pathways. The program includes conversations, healing rituals, performances, film screenings, pop-up exhibitions, and more, aimed at disrupting colonial institutionalized ways of knowledge creation and sharing. As many local programs will exceed the hosting time of the assembly, they will be recorded and made available on a shared online platform, contributing to a publicly accessible archive of decentralized fashion knowledge. We believe there is an urgent need to decentralize knowledge creation and sharing regarding body fashioning, so as to stimulate a more inclusive understanding of fashioning systems and practices especially when these offer different relationships to the environment, time, and cultural heritages. Also, it is essential that this diversity of voices is facilitated in their own terms, in their own languages, and through their own formats. The way the assembly came about is actually um, uh, our own to our inaugural non-conference that initiated the the creation of the collective in October 2012. The Non-Western Fashion Conference was initially an academic platform for disrupting Eurocentric underpinnings of dominant fashion discourse from a post-colonial perspective. But as an informal network without any funding, we would organize conferences through collaborations with local research centers and university departments, like the Centre Jacques Berg in Morocco in 2012, and the London College of Fashion in 2013. We also collaborated with the School of Modern Languages and Cultures in Hong Kong in 2014, at the University of Antwerp in 2016. And finally, the Bunka Gakuen University in Tokyo in 2019. But around 2018, influenced by the work of leading decolonial thinkers like Rolando Vasquez and Walter Mignolo and Mario Lugones and many others, we started to break free from the academic colonial framework and redefine ourselves as a collective, as an experimental platform beyond institutional, disciplinary, and geographical boundaries. Our main aim is to critique the denial and erasure of a diversity of fashioning systems due to Eurocentrism, unequal global power relations based on the modern colonial order, and the Euro-American canon of normativity. Through a global network, Work of sovereign yet connected fashioning coalitions, we want to decentralize dominant fashion discourses and practices and gender solidarity across multiple lines of difference and stimulate self representation, self determination, and self governance regarding fashion. We came to realize that we had been inviting other voices as guests to our table, thereby maintaining unequal global power dynamics and destructive assimilating and homogenizing forces. Transcending academe, the collective structure to experiment with other ways of knowledge creation and sharing through the conversation and through the radical act of listening. From a decolonial perspective, we aim to rethink fashion as a multitude of possibilities rather than a normative framework falsely claiming universality. In the words of leading decolonial thinker and the chair of our advisory board, Rolando Vasquez, to witness the destruction of cultural diversity is to face a radical reduction of roads into the future. 
So therefore in February, 2021, we initiated the monthly online conversations on decoloniality and fashion. Defying Time Zones, inspired, sorry, inspired by the Decolonial Fashion School. Defying Time Zones, Language Barriers, and the Colonial Difference. This shared space for reflection, unlearning, and repair is where participants are welcomed as experts of their own decolonial thinking and doing from their unique positionalities, rather than including other practices and concepts into our own. The conversations aim to bring together in relation participants and their experiences as both pluriversal and interversal. On Western Fashion Conference, we have come to understand that the academic format is not inclusive in terms of who gets to speak and in what form and language this is presented. 10 years after our first conference in Morocco, we wish to create a new kind of long-term platform and program that breaks with the discriminating and hegemonic practices. Intended as a biennial, the assembly is a recurring project based on commitments and trust aimed at building sustainable relationships with communities all over the world. In that sense, we join around the world assemblies sparked by the grassroots to global possibilities of the digital, through which communities share their own ways and in their own ways, pathways to a politics of wholeness. In line with global assemblies organized by the grassroots to global initiative, we share their mission that we can solve our crises using the same way of thinking that created them. With the Fashioning Assembly, we aim to contribute to global and local systemic changes, to the limited and often destructive ways of contemporary fashion, through unlearning and through creating pluriverse spaces for all kinds of people to come together. As a decolonial alternative to Western-centric academic fashion conferences, the assembly is a platform for collective decision-making processes, experimenting with different formats that encourage deep listening and learning each other, as Maria Lugones would formulate it, so that together we can take responsibility for our futures. And Erica, maybe you can zoom in to some of the key elements of the development of the assembly. Mm. Thank you so much, Angela, just for um, opening up the kind of scope um, of the Global Fashioning Assembly and the kind of work that yeah, lies ahead of us or lies around us and that we're sharing today. So fashion plays a key role, not only in terms of how we dress, but also in terms of social and cultural belonging. And as with all design practices, it needs decolonizing. And efforts to decolonize must go beyond simply adding different cultural voices and aesthetic elements into campaigns or creative outputs. I think something that we all um, share very strongly, that what is so often overlooked is the way in which the fashion system itself is understood and how it operates. And that it still privileges largely colonial terms and practices of fashion. So with the assembly, we want to create an opportunity for not only academics, but also students, educators, creatives, consumers, producers, craftspeople, activists, who are interested in expanding their cultural understanding of diverse fashioning systems, to gather, share, listen, unlearn, address, and maybe connect through experiences. And possibly the most important that we're really trying to look at is the way in which these kinds of projects can rebuild trust um, amongst a diverse community. So maybe this idea of disrupting gatekeeping processes, um, the gatekeeping processes of peer reviewing about who does, gets to speak and who doesn't and whose knowledge gets validated, is to think about how these hosting communities of the Global Fashioning Assemblies have not gone through a selection process, but rather have been welcomed into in, in a dialogue and through a network of networks. So each hosting community will, decide, have, will be deciding their own content. And this is what we're going to share a little bit more today, um, deciding their own formats, deciding their own kind of forms of languages, be they visual, be they um, 
um, through translation, be they their audio, and according to very specific experiences and practices, struggles, and even different pathways. So as Angela is already being um, saying, that the program will include conversations, uh, kind of rituals, performances, maybe film screenings, pop-ups, exhibitions. Um, there's a, a fashion exhibition, a fashion um, show um, that we we're live streaming into um, short um, as part of the program. So, so these are aimed at disrupting colonial institutionalized ways of knowledge creation and sharing. And because many of these local programs will exceed the hosting time of the assembly, these will also be recorded. And so these, these key elements have really underpinned um, development of the Global Fashioning Assembly and the way in which we're working together. The idea of, of listening and what it means to listen as an active practice is an incredibly central point. And we're going to perhaps discuss these a little bit um, in a little bit more detail later. The idea of humbling, which is I think central to, to as Angela, um, you already mentioned the decolonial school um, the idea of humbling, humbling the voice of the dominant voice of Western fashion to include other system, um, other systems, other ways of fashioning. The idea of hosting, where guests become hosts and hosts become guests. So how do how do we um, transition from from being a guest to a host and allowing others to host? The question of global time as we travel from, from one area in the world with the sun right across. And, and I think um, um, online possibilities like we're sharing right now has been so central to how we understand the lived realities around the globe um, and transitioning those, those time zones. And then perhaps the, the key sort of idea of what happens in fashion as a kind of translation of space and place, of, of belonging, of, of um, cultural identity. So these ideas of translation, how does it translate from one space into another space as we kind of share and, and communicate across these communities? So I think, I think it's really, really been an incredibly important and generous space for us to start um, communicating and building towards the Global Fashioning Assembly in October. And perhaps at this point, you know, our aim to engage in meaningful cross-cultural and global dialogues to welcome these very diverse fashion systems is to create the context for a self-directed inclusion. And I think I'd like to start then with introducing our first um, speaker and, and coalitional member um, to join us with her presentation. It's a, each of our, our um, um, participants in today's session have produced a, a short film video clip that we can then share and then we can speak to and find out a little bit more. So a really a very warm welcome to Doris Dupont who's joining us. It's a very late in the evening in New Zealand, um, late at night in New Zealand. Um, and Doris um, will share um, her contribution to the Global Fashioning Assembly. Thank you so much. It looks like we're missing sound. I think Angela needs to unmute hers and then it should work. Firstly, I see that the Global Fashion Assembly so provides an opportunity again? to initiate a sharing community here in Aurora. Engage with the Paul Popper, the territory 
different yeah, on, a, on a different platform. Bringing them together a digital and physical event creates a It's the space where the various activists, makers, and creative fashion practitioners can showcase what they're doing. Secondly, the art theoretical contribution to the global fashion assembly opens new channels of communication and a pathway for sharing with an international network that's engaged in decoloniality. It will also create a rich resource for academic institutions and fashion colleges going forward. Our offering for the Global Fashioning Assembly will consist of short video presentations of people's work processes and or their outcomes. This material will either be pre-recorded or documented live as the making happens on site during the session. Creators will attend in person or on Zoom to introduce their work and to participate in a moderated talanoa, a process of inclusive, participatory and transparent dialogue with each other and open to all attendees in Aotearoa and around the world. I do hope that you will join us. Ka kite. <laughs> Good. So I'll just um, join in real time <coughs> and um, I'll say uh, uh, kia ora and, um, and welcome and particularly welcome to um, the people from New Zealand who have joined us. I'm, I'm really delighted to see, um, see a number of you here um, at this late hour. It's um, 11.30 nearly in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, so it's, it's quite late in the evening. And so thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just tell you um, a little bit more about um, the um, where we are in New Zealand and Aotearoa at the moment uh, in terms of um, preparing our, our contribution to the Global Fashioning Assembly. So Angela, if you would um, uh, move through to, um, to the slide, that would be great. The next slide. Um, so it, we we here are not um, not an assembly yet or a group. I know a number of the other um, contributors to this are already an existing um, organisation or coalition or community or network. Um, we don't have such a thing, and I've seen the um, the opportunity here in the Global Fashioning Assembly to actually. Um, create something like that for, um, for New Zealand. There are a lot of people um, um, practicing in, um, in the decolonial spaces in making and, um, and creating. And I wanted to, um, um, I saw this as an opportunity really to, to bring them together to, uh, to converse with each other but also um, to, to build this sort of, uh, this body of knowledge really that's available to, um, um, to, academic, uh, to academia, to, um, to the community at large really. And what's been really interesting about, sorry, it's winter here, you can see the New Zealanders on, um, on your screen, they're the ones who are wearing scarves and cardigans and, um, and warm clothes, it's winter in New Zealand. Um, uh, so, um, so the process of, uh, of doing this has been indeed a, a sort of a tag, uh, a tag process where um, somebody has been invited and they've suggested somebody else and they've suggested somebody else. And um, so the, the um, group of candidates for participation in this is just, um, has just grown and grown. And what's been very interesting about um, how that's grown is that within that we've I've seen some some patterns, some themes of, um, of, uh, of practice um, that I would like to, um, yeah, I suppose to sort of highlight and to, um, to showcase uh, when we um, go live in, uh, in October. Um, so there's, there's a, a um, uh, well, they're in front of you on the screen and I might just move through to some of the people who are examples of the type of uh, the type of thing that I'm talking about. So, Angela, if you would move through to the next slide, please. 
so thinking about crafting um, culture. So crafting culture is, um, I see that as um, people uh, re readdressing, reclaiming and, um, and renewing uh, uh, practices from their, from their parents, from their four uh, um, elders, um, practices that have existed for a long time in their culture and um, probably have not um, been at the forefront really of fashion making. So you see in both of these um, two examples that I've got here, these uh, garments or garments that were in an exhibition that, um, uh, that the Fashion Museum curated two years ago called Moana Currents, looking at contemporary um, Moana practice influences in New Zealand um, fashion. Um, on the left here, you've got a gown, it's called Ta'oko Tai, and it's made by uh, Sheena um, Tai Valanga, and with her mother, who was a, an expert in um, Tavaivai, which is the, um, the embroidery, the Pacific embroidery. Uh, they make um, uh, quilts and, uh, and pillowcases and, um, and various assorted things with, uh, with stitching. Um, and she has made use that, uh, that technique on this dress. So the, the, the bodices, um, uh, like uh, thatching and the, uh, the skirt, has these embroidered flowers on the back. The one on the right is another um, Tavaivai technique, which is patchworking. People will all know patchworking is a particular form um, that is uh, practiced in the Cook Islands. Uh, and this is a, a very young, modern um, version of that. So just looking, there are a lot of practices. The young woman in the, um, in the dress on the right has also got over her shoulder um, a, 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 um, a kākahu, a, a cloak. Um, made with modern uh, modern materials. Uh, so the, there are a lot of people working with um, practices that, um, uh, yes, so old, older practices that they're reviving and modernizing and using again. So that's one group of um, practitioners that, are with, that will be showcasing their work at, um, at the Aotearoa uh, Global Fashioning Assembly. Uh, in the next slide, please, Angela. Is, um, is uh, connective threads. And uh, this uh, is, um, I, I, think, uh, I think you said, and in fact, I heard in the introduction to, uh, uh, to the session at um, STOF that um, that group making, that collaboration is, is a, a big part of, um, particularly of indigenous making and of contemporary making, that people work together. And uh, in these pictures, and we've got two examples of, um, of uh, people who work like that. So on the um, on the right, you've got these uh, um, uh, Cookie Ailani creative mamas, and they are working on a design by um, um, Tukia uh, Turia, who is a um, uh, um, a, a Divaivai, uh, creative, and they're making it an embroidered fabric that's going to um, be made into a, a high fashion garment. Um, that uh, for designer Karen Walker, New Zealand designer Karen Walker, that's going to be shown at the Commonwealth uh, Fashion Exchange in the UK. These women are incredibly, um, in incredibly skilled, and they work, as you can see. These uh, there's a whole a number of women working on the same piece of textile. On the left, you've got a group called the Pacific Sisters, um, who are a collective who have been a collective, an activist collective, and fashion collective who have been working together since the 1990s and are still. Um, still uh, come together for projects um, and for, for fashion making. So that um, collective um, enterprise is something that's, um, that's very common in, in practice here and uh, will be another aspect of what we showcase. Can I please have the next slide, Angela? Um, so this is um, properly dressed is, is, a, is a concept that um, that came up indeed when uh, when I was curating um, the Moana Currents exhibition. Um, the idea that um, uh, being uh, dressed is not just about a, a, a garment, but there are a whole lot of other aspects to being dressed. It's how you uh, dress your hair, um, how you uh, uh, adorn your body, uh, you know, any accessories and things that you might wear that are right for the occasion. And so the image on the left you have here is, uh, is tattoo. 
uh, tatau, actually, because it's a Samoan version of tattoo. Um, there's a, a really strong revival in um, in uh, uh, tatau tattoo in uh, in in Aotearoa, and uh, we w I'm hoping to have a number of um, practitioners of uh, tatau being part of the um, of the group. The um, <coughs> excuse me, the image on the right is a um, a hay tiki. A hay tiki is a uh, a, a and a piece of adornment that uh, that that uh, has been part of a Maori dress for um, for centuries, and um, it's usually made out of uh, punamu or out of um, bone. And uh, but this particular example is three D printed, so it's talking about um, uh, embracing those sort of traditional practices, but in a very very modern way. And uh, so we we'll have some other some um, participants in the group that are working in um, in various forms of um, body uh, adornment and uh, and uh, and decorative uh, decorative wear. And the last slide, please, Angela. Yes, yeah, so fashioning the future. I've, I've, uh, this is. Um, um, something that, uh, that that comes up and something that we can't forget actually is the economics of fashion making. Um, you know, um, how can you be true to um, to yourself and to your making, and still uh, still earn, you still pay the rent? Um, so looking at sustainable models of making, and um, and ways of gaining access um, to market. So on the left we have a garment by Adrian Whitewood. And Adrian Whitewood has chosen the pathway she has chosen for uh, commercial production is to embrace um, um, imagery from uh, to Ao Māori, so from the Māori world, um, Māori world um, view, using the designs and things from there, contemporizing them and putting them onto um, onto garments. This, this particular one is called Pitao Amanaya. It's the spiral, the spiral of life. And uh, she uh, has these digitally printed um, and made in China, so that they become affordable, uh, aff uh, affordable pieces, um, but are still very true to um, to who she is. On the right, you have another strategy, which is Kerry Nathan. Kerry Nathan is a couturier, a Maori couturier, and um, she brings the two worlds together. So the high fashion of the runway, with again. Um, Using contemporary materials, but but um, drawing on old um, techniques of weaving, and uh, and using um, imagery and, and symbolism um, from um, uh, from Te Ao Māori. Uh, she's also um, leading a, a a group of new generation designers, uh, helping them gain the wherewithal to um, to be commercially successful through the Kahui Collective. And she will be part of our um, our group as well. Um, so those are some of the people who are um, who we're hoping to showcase to um, to everyone in in October. Uh, we'll have them there, and they'll be able to tell their own stories. And uh, then I can um, be quiet. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Doris. So the next collective we're hosting community we would like to introduce is speaking to us from Kenya. Founder of Onyo Culture, which will be the hosting community from Kenya. Onyo Culture is an online platform that encourages young Kenyans to embrace their heritage through wearing and styling of traditional accessories. My aims for developing this online platform were to promote, preserve, and educate and showcase the importance of traditional jewelry and its relevance in the fashion space today. I have since nurtured this into a virtual community that reimagines what fashion is when traditional jewelry is included and based on our own local context. The current fashion rules leave out traditional jewelry styles. We therefore invent our own rules as we go along, but using our historical context. I believe fashion is a sense of self-expression, and in Kenya has been an expression of its people. 
each ornament has to be given its rights and respected as part of fashion, both as critical and creative acknowledgement. To further this work, I propose to produce a performance ritual that showcases how fashion and identity are intricately woven together. This ritual will only feature women whose input has often been silenced on historical matters. This piece will serve to highlight the importance of allowing every human to express their fashion heritage. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Chef Kimboy. So I think you have made, given us a little snapshot or a sneak peek, how, what is it called? Um, of what you are thinking of sharing for the assembly, I believe in October. Maybe you want to talk to it. Shall I? Yes. Um, okay. Just, just open the. Oh, how did it go back? Phil? Sorry, everyone. Then I will talk through it. I don't know why we went back. But we did. My film is going to be about um, meeting the artisans preserving traditional fashion. So I will start there of the video which was taken at the Artisan Center in a conservancy in Narok in Southwestern Kenya. We are discussing the importance of traditional fashion with an experienced bead artisan. Um, she was giving me tips and telling me how she keeps her traditional heritage alive through her fashion choices. She's a lady on the right and she's giving me, she was explaining to me in uh, Swahili and we're having a conversation. You can see she's wearing a beaded belt. Um, her white dress has uh, some beaded patterns and there's a way she's tied a cloth across her shoulder, which is called the lesser cloth. So she was explaining to me why and how she makes her fashion choices as a beadwork artisan and also someone from a community that keeps um, traditional culture alive. And this part of the video, I wanted to really showcase the design methods that, and which have been passed down through various generations. I wanted to show how the beadwork is made. In this part of the video, I am in the Masa market, which is a caravan market in downtown Nairobi. In this market, one can find all sorts of arts, crafts, clothing, and jewelry from all over the continent. This market, moves around the city on various days throughout the week. So this one was in the in downtown center of the Nairobi Central Business District. That is some of the jewelry that they sell. Um, for example, you can find various styles of traditional fashions and some of the ones which are popular, the circular necklaces that you can see in the photos. And some of them range to up to 15 inches in diameter. And you can also see beaded clothes and the little the other little shapes that are earrings and headpieces. You can see they come in various bright colors. Traditional aesthetics generally remain the same, but there are newer color schemes which have emerged. And around public holidays, necklaces with a Kenyan flag, as you can see in the image in the right on the right, there. Necklaces which are red, black, green, and white are very popular. This is an election year, so there's a lot of politics and political conversations around. So those are some of the common colors you can see in the market. As I mentioned, this caravan market moves to different locations in the city. So this part of the film, I took it in a, in a, in a market um, mall, uh, which they turned the car park, gara, the, car park area into a market where the artisans can set up their beadwork and sell. So this was during setup. You can see that some artisans were setting up and you can see the lines on the floor, which indicate that this is a car park, but converted into a market on that particular day. You can see these masks and different types of crafts from across the country. So my purpose for making this film was to showcase the, and share the stories of the, of the artisans preserving traditional fashion 
in the snippet you could see the artisans at work, some were even doing their bead work even as they sell. Their unique style themes within the Maasai market, which really is a whole fashion ecosystem on its own. For example, because it's election year in Kenya, there are political party themed beadworks, as well as necklaces which have colors of the national flag. The setup is the same in each market. Artisans have racks on which they hang the items they sell, and these racks are easily dismantled and they can carry them from one market to the other. Some markets you can find the same artisans, while other markets, depending on the location, have different artisans. In this market, one can find all sorts of crafts, uh, art and clothing from all around the continent. Ironically, only a handful of beadworks are, from, are, tra are traditional beadworks, which are from communities such as the Maasai artisans and not much from other parts of the country. Some artisans such as the first lady I spoke to in the video, is dressed and adorned in beadwork. In the video snippet, I am in one of the markets downtown in Nairobi Central Business District. And on a separate day, I visited an upmarket mall in Nairobi. So the filming process um, involves, of course, obtaining permission uh, from the artisans uh, who I was talking to the videos and visiting the artisan where the artisans where they feel comfortable to be filmed because some prefer to be filmed at home while others are okay with being filmed at the market. I really want to highlight the importance and relevance of traditional fashion and the makers and the people who still keep these uh, old design systems alive even today. I liked the format of film because it is raw and real and you can really hear and feel the story being told and you can have a feel of where the story is coming from. To give a context about Onyo culture, in Kenya, Western modes of dressing are dominant, despite all the beadwork that I've shown in the film. It's not that popular, it's not that common to find someone dressed the way that I'm dressed. Our actual fashion of the past was colonized out of us, and I created this online space so that we can remember what fashion is based on, based on our own history. In the past, across the country, body adornments, especially beadwork, was common. Both men and women wore adornments on every part of their body, and this really fascinated me. I chose to work with jewelry as beadwork is a common thread among all Kenyans. And these, and there also exist a handful of communities that still maintain their traditional fashion aesthetics. For example, the headpiece I'm wearing is from the Samburu community, and the, my necklace, uh, my, this first necklace is also from the Samburu community, which is located in southern Kenya. Um, what drew me to the Global Fashion Assembly was the open format of the event. I am free to share my work in whatever format I choose. And for this year's edition, I wanted to present a film about Kenyan traditional fashion and all the individuals who make it, especially the women. Because if I found in a lot of the research and history books, it's usually the men who talked about, you know, the men who maybe who was the chief or who was the elder or the leader or the head of the home was the one who talks about or describes to the writer who was also a man about this history and the stories about the jewelry. So I wanted to get the women's perspective and I wanted the stories told from their perspective. In my work, I've amassed and shared a wealth of stories passed down through generations and I wish for those stories to be told. Another great thing in working with the GFA community is that I'm the one to tell my story in my own way. Even if I'm performing a ritual, all of it is welcome. If I choose to present in Swahili or any Kenyan language, I have the space and freedom to do so. There's also the time factor accommodation. Given the time difference across all of the collaborating communities, some meetings have been late at night in my time zone, but the meetings are recorded and I'm able to catch up with them the next thing in the morning. And now um, our meetings lately have been twice a day and that enables everyone to catch up and be in flow with the planning process. And together, we always make all the decisions together. It's also been interesting to collaborate across the globe and see the unique ways that everybody from each part of the world approaches things. Uh, in my country and all the events I have personally organized, planning usually starts one month or three months to the event. We also have our general elections in August. And I realized in my country, we have a culture of not never making solid plans after the election. So even the film participants, participants have spoken to, some will make their final decisions as the days draw closer. 
when I joined GFA earlier this year, it was hard for my team and I to settle on an exact project that we will present because of the time frame. For all our festivals, we always plan them at least three months in advance. So it's been very interesting to make concrete plans 10 months in advance. Um, we're really looking forward to the coming together of the event and putting together and finalizing the whole film, film. And I hope to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chef Kimboy. Okay, so our next hosting community is speaking to us from London, but representing North Africa. Hi, my hi. Hey, my name is Nada Koresh. I am here to disrupt. I'm a lecturer and doctoral researcher at CSAD. I'm also a FACE academic and I am starting a new job at UE as a fashion comm lecturer. I like cool stuff like this designer Shafian Wakil. I read a lot of books that seem confusing like Bayard's The Illusion of Cultural Identity. And yes, again, I like more cool stuff that's from North Africa. I've done a lot of talks, a lot of research, and a lot of work surrounding our cultural identities and how we can express that through fashion, whether it's through our gangster Abeya, whether it's through a local TV show mug, whether it's through a juxtaposition of cultural eras, glams, different cultures, all melded into one through informed conscious design. I am a product of my ancestors, I am a product of my legacies, and I am a product of my cultural surroundings. I am also a mum of two amazing children that I hope will grow up to be disruptive, to be researchers, to be curious and informed. I come from the land of the pyramids, but I also come from a land with the Amazigh people because I got embraced and married into that land. And my mission through my collective, Fashion Liberation Collective, is to design for us, by us, for the rest of the world, and to use our expertise to get you all involved. Cultural Slay is a weekly segment I do. I also do a few talks on the dire effects of Orientalism. And through my lectures and through my research, I hope that I can get the rest of the world to embrace holistic, informed, culturally aware design. I am based in the UK. I travel a lot. And through my travels, I learn, I share my knowledge, and I hope that through my PhD and through my work as a teacher and legacy creator that I can bring to you a true vision of East meets West and of sensitive and informed design. I hope this finds you all well and take care. We will be presenting at the Global Fashioning Assembly 2022. See you See you October 2022. Welcome to North Africa anytime. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nadia. Um, excuse my uh, video. Um, I'm not that apt with apps, uh, but I'm getting there. Um, so I founded the Fashion Liberation Collective of North Africa. I am based out of the UK, but I'm Egyptian. Uh, Turkish and I am married to an Amazigh Algerian man, hence my um, embracing of the North African culture as a whole. Um, I'll start off by saying why I first got involved in the Global Fashioning Assembly. It was something that really appealed to me on many levels and also to a lot of my collective members. We're a very, very small collective, um, but I think it's quite powerful in a way because everyone that's there wants to be there for the same reason, which is to reclaim and reown our design cultures, our design languages, and bring it to the world um, to kind of escape uh, that local uh, localization, but to bring local to the to the global um, audience and to do it in an informed and holistic manner. And the Global Fashioning Assembly is a really amazing platform that has given us hopefully the tools and the new shared experiences to get all of our local cultures 
in a more global um, to a more global audience uh, without losing any of their authenticity, without losing any of their um, legacy, without losing any of their roots or any of their uh, unique cultural identities. So that's why I originally got involved. We're hoping to present to all of you uh, online and in real life through three or four actually main events, one out of Cardiff, Wales, United Kingdom, which will comprise of a decolonial meme workshop, which is very entertaining. Um, and then we shall also be, it should also be followed by an exhibition. Uh, the next event should be out of Algiers and Marrakesh, which will be run by one of our collective members, Jay Zainab Ashubi, uh, who is going to uh, virtually and physically move people through her weaving, which is MSZ weaving techniques, where you'll get to physically go or physically go through the weaving machine and come out of the weaving machine as a woven fabric. Uh, that's also followed by an exhibition and a short documentary about local designers and artists and tattoo artists who specialize in MSZ uh, Qabayli North African tattoos which are tribal tattoos that have been erased or have been, um, have been almost omitted from history. So it's a really amazing art form that has taken them a lot of time to research. It's filled with symbolism and filled with odes to secret languages used uh, during the colonial period. We will then move on to Egypt, uh, Cairo, where we are hoping to present from a very historic old um, location, which is yet to be confirmed, so I won't tell you quite what it is, uh, but there we will be running a decolonial collage workshop run by James Green, who's an artist from Wales and was a colleague of mine for many years. He runs the fine arts department in British University, Egypt, and it's then followed by a folklore dance by the Folklore Dance Tribe, <clears throat> and also then followed by an exhibition and talks and a walk around, a uh, virtual walk around Old Cairo, uh, where everyone will get to experience the feel of Cairo and in all its raw authenticity. Uh, and yes, and a little bit about our members. I don't know if Angela, you can put up the website, but if you can't, it's okay. <laughs> we can give you a quick run through. So we are growing and um, hopefully we're hoping to get more. Yes, there we go. And if you scroll down to, keep going, keep going. If you scroll down to our members, so meet the team. Um, I, I'd really like to introduce some of them. That's me again. You don't need to see me again, All right? <laughs> we'll go down to our members, perfect. And then, we have people from Morocco, Egypt, and Algeria, and we're currently speaking to a few others. So one of our members is Yassine Morabit, who's a young Moroccan designer. Uh, he's worked with Adidas. He's worked with Moroccan singers such, such as Saad al Um, He has a very iconic take on fashion. It's a mix of Amazigh fashion and anime and manga. Um, and then if we move on to the next collective member, Oh, if you stay there and then just click the arrow that goes that way. So if you go back up, Angela, sorry. This one? Yeah, so go back to your scene and then there's a little arrow on the right. Yeah, there we go. To Lily, that is my brand, which is based on, um, it's my daughter's name, which means freedom, uh, which hopefully will be the collective's brand where people will have a platform to uh, sell and share their designs and in the future we're hoping as a collective to take on interns to teach and spread this idea of informed design and how people can make successful design brands whilst keeping their North African DNA and if you go to the next one yes yeah, so if you go click that way so if you It's taking a while to load. 
Yes, so Medina Mood is also um, one of our boutiques, which is part of our collective, and Minal Madi is another one of our brands. Uh, what I'd like to say in closing, because I know the website's a bit slow, um, is all our brands and all our designers and artists have one thing in common, and it's that they are true to their roots and they pay homage to their roots whilst also maintaining a very clear style or cultural DNA through their designs. And that's what we want is that it's designs for us, by us, for everyone else. Um, and yeah, I hope to get some questions later. Thank you so much, Nada. So let me see if I can put this on. And Leah, have you joined us? My name is Leah Vene, and I'm a researcher at the Center for Fashion and Clothing Research that is based in Zagreb, Zagreb Croatia. We are a nonprofit and non governmental, governmental institution that is focused on research in global fashion histories. Specifically in relation to socialist and post socialist, political, cultural, and social. For the context of this conference, we want to propose several topics. Uh, one of them is something that we are currently researching, and that's the phenomenon of self-colonization and how it relates to the dichotomies in the West and Center and Periphery. Besides that, we are researching the topic of uh, I don't know if it's only glitching for me or for everyone. Maybe discuss how it relates to non fashion communities and also everyday clothing practices. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can just jump in and. Uh, just at least for me, the video is like su super glitching. Uh, I don't know if it was understandable at all. Uh, can you hear me? Of collective collaborative work and to discuss ways in which it could function within. We seem to have lost Angela and the glitch. <laughs> um, Leo, would you like to maybe yeah. just join in? Thank you and welcome. Thank you for joining us from Croatia. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you for listening. I wasn't sure whether you were able to hear the video. For me, it was like really glitching a lot. So I'll just start from the scratch. I wasn't sure what you heard. So um, I'm here in behalf of uh, Timo, a center for fashion and clothing research that is based in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, we are a nonprofit that was founded in 2013, uh, and uh, we kind of uh, try to work somewhere um, in between uh, kind of academic work, uh, but also activist work, uh, also working uh, with students. Uh, so we're trying to build an educational pl platform as well. We kind of figured that there's um, uh, there's this platform on, in that sense, kind of a missing on a local level kind of a starting point for our research, which I think will also be embedded in what we will propose for the Global Fashion Assembly is kind of a rereading socialist and post-socialist um, fashion histories, which are very much untold, or at least have been uh, maybe also observed from this point of view of West looking at what was the history of the Eastern fashion. And we're trying to rewrite this history on a, from a local point of view. Uh, I mean, the problem is that there isn't even literature or materials written in local language, let alone enough in English. So we're trying to kind of balance this too, to bring these histories to broader audiences as well. Uh, our research kind of started, uh, yeah, kind of unpacking uh, this um, uh, link between 
uh, fashion and ideology and a, a socialist uh, system. Uh, but we've kind of uh, moved to um, to bring this into a broader sense of like what is the post-socialist reality, and that's here is where we kind of bring in this very important uh, term for us, and that's a term of uh, self-colonization, which is super important, and we try to embed it within this uh, local histories, and it's one of the topics that we want to bring into the table for the Global Fashion Assembly with several speakers. Some of them are more visual artists and fashion designers, and some are more uh, theoreticians, which will kind of try to bring this topic into a dialogue and kind of see in which way we could reflect on it and see how it shaped or what currently we see in a local fashion system. Uh, I mentioned um, two dichotomies that for us are very relevant in all of the work that we do in CIMO, and one is this um, East and West dichotomy, and the, one, and the other one is center and periphery, which I think is super relevant for kind of telling these uh, local fashion uh, stories. Um, what we kind of try to do in our work is also go beyond following only fashion design or fashion system, but try to think more in the broader terms of what is uh, local clothing cultures. Uh, where does clothing come in in our everyday practice, or maybe clothing cultures of, of groups or um, um, collectives which we don't consider as fashion collectives. So maybe more thinking about uh, in um, or in terms of anti-fashion. So um, for all of our research, we've been tackling a lot the topic of workwear. Uh, how does it represent identity? What does it mean in relation to specifically socialist and post-socialist histories? Um, and it's one of the topic that we bring in uh, to our uh, researchers and to our collaborators. So for example, this year we are doing a project with uh, visual artists who are taking over some uh, aspects of uh, workwear histories and kind of a redesigning it uh, in between an art piece and, uh, and a new potential uh, uh, approach to what is workwear and how it relates to, to local histories. Um, besides that, I think uh, our interest is also, as I said, like kind of a non-fashion groups as well. We had a big research related to peasant cultures. What is the peasant uh, clothing um, element and how we could give it a new, uh, new reading because it's been very marginalized also somewhere in the periphery in between urban and rural. So we're trying to find these zones which are maybe also and not easily fitted in the box that you would usually find if you were only interested in fashion as such. Um, our community is kind of a small because Croatia is a super small country. So we're always trying to kind of uh, broaden uh, our dialogues in that sense. I think for us it's super valuable to be part of the Global Fashion Assembly and to join this group just to not stay only within the local topics. But I feel there's uh, many links to how we approach. Maybe we don't research the same things, but I think the way that we approach it is very similar. And sometimes in a small country like a Croatia, you can feel very lonely uh, in, in what you do and how you research. So I think for us, it's super interesting to have a broader context uh, for a discussion. Um, so I'm really hoping that by October, uh, we also are in the midst of planning uh, the exact uh, event that we will uh, share with you during the fashion uh, assembly. But uh, the plan is that we, yeah, we, we are organizing a kind of a dialogue among several uh, invited speakers that would include some visual material, but also would focus a lot on, on discussing some of the topics that I've been uh, mentioning previously. Um, I would also like to share uh, our website. I will just post, uh, post it because I didn't get a chance to prepare any uh, extra uh, visuals for today for the presentation, but uh, we were able to uh, do a bilingual version of our website. It's also still in a bit of a process of working because it's a kind of a, it's, it's a non-profit work. It's just uh, something that we try to do uh, <laughs> besides our full-time jobs. So we are doing our best. So you could see a lot of the materials there. There's a project descriptions and we managed to translate some of the text that we've been writing together with our collaborators. So it could give you like a bit of a broader uh, perspective on what you're interested in. So I'm super looking forward to continue this discussion and again, see you all also in October. Thanks. Thank you so much, Leah. Should I try to play the second video? I'm so very sorry for the, the bad internet connection on the Belgian countryside. No worries. But I think I've said I quite a lot. lot. So yeah. it's fine. Okay. Do you take over, Erica? Um, I was going to say, let's try the second video. If it is glitching, then, then we can. If it just, it's such a Insight into the way in which you're welcome to the professional clothing uh, research that is based in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, I'm going to give you a small
tour of our offices, which is basically a library where most of our work uh, is done and uh, also where we get most of the inspiration for the project uh, that we pr produce. Uh, what you see around me is a lot of books. Uh, it's different kinds of materials uh, related to the field of fashion theory, fashion history, textile history, uh, but also different materials. that we gather, which is photographs, maybe more locally uh, connected and also different kinds of brochures and other types of documents that are relevant for our research. Um, I would say that um, a lot of our research is focused on um, local fashion Now is the most interesting part with the books that I've selected to the show. History, but. The history of uh, early socialism and how we can read what happens within fashion. And I want to show you a few materials that uh, were maybe relevant for our research. For example, here we have a brochure that's uh, presenting different types of workwear, as there is a strong emphasis of textile industry and in which way it uh, shaped the workwear of the time. Or maybe uh, promotional material, magazines from the period of socialism and how they represent the figure, female figures, uh, kind of a fami feminist aspect of um, fashion and the role of fashion in uh, representing women in the public space. Besides that, I think uh, we are very much interested in relation in between fashion and art and we've been forming several projects that would uh, tackle oh, this link uh, definitely through collaborating with designers uh, and artists and uh, I also want to show you one of the projects that maybe represents this topic very well. This is a brochure from Project uh, Bolsa, Briefing on Soft Arts, that we've been doing for several years. This is the most recent edition from 2021. Project by Jelko Belian, an artist who did a project with macrame. So he's been making uh, big site-specific sculptures uh, with macrame in a kind of a, a found space of former stores. So we're always trying to also um, play with the um, uh, white cube spaces, but also with tight specific spaces and see what happens when uh, uh, sculptures happen to appear there. Uh, in the project Briefing on Soft Arts um, and this concept of uh, softness has also been tackled in different other ways. For example, this is an example of um, a project by Josipa Stefanec, where she created anthropomorphic uh, figures, let's say, in the white cubes how we made it through the, the Our projects are also looking into invisible uh, local
fashion and clothing histories. For example, Locus Artists is a project that tackled um, uh, peasant culture. And uh, we realized that this has not really been talked about. And then there is a need to find a way to uh, represent this part of our local history, this kind of a link in between a rural and urban. And we've been gathering different kinds of materials related to, to dress, to textiles, and to female voices that are very much present in the peasant culture. And we created this small brochure where, um, this... I think this is basically the end. Maybe I mean, there's no need to wait for this to, to load. This is the, the very ending of the video, I think. Yeah, but it's so interesting, but I understand. <laughs> Erica, back to you. Oh, have we lost Erica? Oh no! <laughs> yeah, she was actually talking about, uh, what is it again? Power cuts in South Africa that she's been uh, fighting with for the last couple of days. So maybe we have lost Erica. So first of all, I wanna thank all the hosting communities. Thank you so much for representing, for joining, um, for organizing, but also, yeah, just, I mean, Maybe we didn't explain it very well in the beginning, but so the, the assembly is us, it's all the communities um, together. And so, yeah, it wouldn't work. So, that's the part where we would just like to dig in for instances, um, how, how we, yeah, how about what, a year ago? No, a couple of months ago, we, um, we, yeah, we started thinking about the project and how to um, take it on. And it's definitely been challenging, I think for different communities in different ways. Um, but yeah, Erica, you would have, you prepared some questions, I believe that we could address. No, still not here. Okay, then maybe I should start. Because um, I think the way we took it on, it's very, very um, interesting to invite communities, people, individuals to something that is not defined, that is not <laughs> described of what it is. Um, so it was definitely confusing, I think, in the, in the first couple of meetings, because we didn't want to come with a framework. We didn't want to come with what we were expecting or what we were um, asking of communities to contribute. We wanted to kind of like define and, 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 and determine that together collectively. So I think the first couple of meetings was very much like, okay, how, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna get about? And of course, we reached out to a number of initiatives uh, amongst the other the global to um, the grassroots to global uh, initiative who has been organizing these types of, um, yeah, um, a 24 hour around the world um, um, meetings, assemblies. But so I don't know who wants to share what that was like, especially in the beginning, like when we were all kind of like a bit lost and confused of how we're gonna, where'd you start? <laughs> I don't mind sharing a bit if you need. <laughs> I think it something that's quite unique about this as well is I don't think people realize that a lot, we've never met in prison, I think any of us, it's all been online and it's quite an, a strange experience um, in that I feel quite connected to everyone here, but I've never seen them in person. So we've never had these, you know, physical interactions and actually, a lot of what we say is is through body language and positioning and and things like our, you know, our, our, our water bottles and, and objects around us. And it's really interesting how we've only had this kind of square space to communicate our personalities and our feelings about the project. And I think it's really amazing what everyone is doing and the autonomy of it and everyone's just kind of carrying on in their own world, but we're all connected in this 
unique way. Yeah, and especially the concept of time, right? I think Chuck um <laughs> formulated it beautifully. Like we kind of like came in, oh no, we only have one year to prepare. And I believe Chuck Convoy, but also I remember Ruhi from India saying, there's no way I can get people to commit this long in advance of a project, you know, taking place in October. But we were mainly thinking, I think, of the funding, the funding applications, right, that usually take a long time to, to come through. But yeah, definitely the concept of time, right, is very interesting. Jack and Boy, maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on that. And you were saying about elections, don't prepare anything before elections or after elections. Yeah, yes, uh, our elections are happening um, in August. So there's, there's sometimes a resistance from people because some people would go back to their home um, villages. I mean, they move from the city and go back to the village and that's where they vote from. So they don't know when we are We're just all hoping for I think that had opinions have come to realize. We are not in an election season in the event space, getting people to commit to a bit. You just have to wait for the to come closer. So it's been very interesting to plan around that. Um, and then also the thing of the time differences, um, because of the time in Europe, the time was, uh, I think to the, to the time it was two hours ahead of me. So sometimes the evening meetings would be very late at night for me, they'd be like at 10 p.m. So I would never attend those meetings. But then now when you move to the morning meetings or when the time zone again, when the timing changed again, to now the time difference is one hour for me. I'm able to join all the meetings. So it's been very interesting to learn those time shifts and when they happen. And also like on email, how we talk and we say, maybe our meetings at 10 a.m., but is it 10 a.m. because there's a time change or is it 10 a.m. because of the time system. So it's been very interesting to keep up with that because in my side of this, in Eastern Africa, we don't have that. Our time remains the same throughout the year. You know, sunset, sunrise is always relatively around the same time. So it's been interesting to learn to the exact timings and the type changes for everyone else. Yeah, you actually reminded me of the fact that at some point we chose to do things in one day and whoever couldn't join could listen to the recordings. I, I mean, I, I had forgotten that before we didn't do that, but yeah, it was just not very accommodating to everyone to have only one meeting. But then, yeah, having two meetings and having everyone catch up <laughs> on what was being said in the other meeting, that was also quite a challenge. But yeah, I guess, I mean, that for me is very key to this project is, is making it up as you go along. I think especially participating now to this conference was kind of like a, a test <laughs> of how to deal with actual deadlines and having to produce, like we had to, produce the website, we had to produce the logo, uh, we had to come up with all sorts of like how we're gonna do it. Um, so I thought that was very interesting because before it was much more about, I think, brainstorming on what it was or what it could be. But then with this concrete event, I mean, Erica, maybe you can say a little bit more, you kind of like had to do on something. Mm. Thank, thank you, Angela, and apologies, I sort of left the room for a moment and I'm back. Um, um, I think the idea of collaboration, and I think it's come through in so many of the um, projects that you've shared, um, you know, it started with Doris, but Nada, you also spoke about it, Chip Kimboy um, also spoke about it, and then Leah, just in that very small collaborative event. What does it mean to collaborate? And maybe that's sort of one of the real strengths of connecting to these fashioning systems that we're wanting to show and share in October is the power of collaboration that has sustained these fashioning practices despite the kind of colonial erasures or the colonial kind of disavowal. It is the it is the connectedness and it's the collaborative um, efforts to sustain and to, to hold on to these things. 
So even in us, Angela, you're asking, even in us in preparing for this um, coalitional event, we're building trust relations um, um, in dialogue. Um, so we had, uh, in terms of developing the logo, for example, the kinds of dialogues and the kinds of sharing that needed to work in terms of the website, in terms of the funding applications, these are all happening in dialogue. And so, so really the kind of possibilities for our program that are drawing on our members' experience of the ways in which their fashioning systems work. So I think there's a, a synergy between the way in which we're constructing our program and the ways in which um, diverse fashioning systems have been sustained, um, built on trust, built on sort of a local truth, um, truth to roots or truth to heritage or truth to self or truth to community. So, so I think there's a, a beautiful synergy that's happening there. Um, and yeah, maybe back to you, Angela, if you, if you want to take, take that question a little further. Um, oh, well, I mean, what it makes me think of is um, you're talking about trust. Uh, which I think is very interesting because I've also been wondering how somehow maybe along the line or along the way we kind of lost people as well and I'm wondering um, so when we started we didn't have a clear idea how we were going to shape the assembly we had some like bottom lines of what it was going to be but still most of it we didn't want to impose our framework and we did want to kind of like unlearn the, the colonial academic framework of a conference. But by kind of like disrupting that, I feel like also quite a few people then felt like, well, then what is it going to be? And this is taking too much time <laughs> to define what it is going to be. And so along the way, we may have lost a few people that felt it wasn't clear enough or it wasn't structured enough. and that it also takes me back to time that working collaboratively, collectively is much more time consuming than when you have a system of, of, of top down, uh, a clear framework. This is how it's going to be. These are the deadlines. This is the timeline. This is what we're expecting from you at what stage in the project. Uh, please deliver. Of course, that's much more efficient and clear and therefore maybe for some people safer because it's clear what is expected from them and what they need to again you know contribute or deliver so there's trust and there's time we are so used to kind of like working in this extremely rigid and in a sense i suppose efficient way of working towards a final product whereas i think me at some point I got lost, at some point I got whatever, I don't know, scared or frustrated. But when I shifted my mind away from the final product, away from what we were going to deliver in October and onto the process, onto going through the motions and the emotions of, of, of working on this collaboratively, that has become for me the main objective, if you like. And, and so then you kind of also can let go of that idea of time frame and efficiency, but maybe that's not safe for everybody. I'm not sure. Um, Angela, can yeah. I just um, suggest you close the um, presentation um, so that we can see everyone who's participating and we can um, um, have a conversation that looks more like a conversation. Thank you. Good idea. Thank you, Doris. Um, I think, uh, sorry, because uh, me and Chapkin Boy and Antoinette have been working on the social media side of things and the website. And it's really interesting how you say, because we're so indoctrined into this way of thinking and a structure and a specific sequence of events, uh, it was quite... Um, it was, I mean, 
it was quite a shock to the system when also you're letting go of control of things. I think we found it, I, for speaking for myself, I don't know if Antoinette and Chepkin boys well want to um, add their comments, but I found it really hard trying to get people to give information before just getting things done, because I'm so used to just getting it done. And it's really hard to wait on numerous, you know, images and info and, um, be dependent on so many other people in achieving the same goal, which usually you'd have to kind of achieve on your own, like setting up a website or setting up a feed. Um, and that was actually quite challenging in just getting people to uh, hand over information. I think we get quite precious about our imagery and our Im information. And I didn't realize how, how much I loved <laughs> some of, you know, the things I'd created until people were like, would you want to share it? And I was like, oh, no, no, I can't, I can't it's mine. I can't possibly share it. And I've never been in that position because usually as a designer, you design for other brands and you're detached from it. But when it's your own brand or your own collective or your own people, I'm quite motherly when it comes to my collective members' products. And so... I get quite um, protective over their work and I get quite um, a bit, you know, oh, should I share this? Should I not share this? So that was quite interesting, having to get everyone's authorization and having to get everyone agree on one thing. I think there's something to be said about that in terms of like the individual over the collective and almost our loss of ways of working within community and like the loss of not really knowing how to function within a group. It's like we're so used to individualism and I would probably say like capitalism in a lot of ways where you are protective of your imagery or your content. Why? Because you think somebody's going to steal it maybe or um, people are going to have an opinion on it that maybe you don't want to hear or whatever that may be. But I think it goes to show that even in this one act, we can really see this um, divergence from the notion of working within community. Hmm. <laughs> of it they're gonna not as you say they're not they're gonna like it but absolutely we have we have completely lost the ability of 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 being part of a collective and not yeah or can that struggle between your individual i suppose and and the collective but then again what are the the cons i would say or the sorry the pros um of doing me what i mean Mm -hmm. Angela, I'm I'm going to um just How add to that what, what has been made. Like. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of 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 what are the benefits, but also just maybe just to expand that a little bit. What is it, you know, what has it been to as as the collective also be in charge in terms of that self-government and that self-determination? Because as much as as it is about working together, it is also about taking taking a certain kind of ownership within that community, within that collective. So, what are these 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 um, opportunities for self government, for self determination um, within the assembly? Um, and and maybe I mean I'd I'd open it up um, if anybody would like to to comment on that. Maybe um, I was thinking, um, Doris, um, yes. just with the, the question of the conference um, and, yes. and, and setting up a collective in, in New Zealand following our, our engaged dialogues. Yes, yes so it's, uh, <coughs> in um, my role well, with the Fashion Museum and curating exhibitions, um, <coughs> particularly in the last, so I've always had co-curators, um, but, um, the particularly the last one that um, that we curated, which is called To Fashion, um, it was actually very uh, 
I, I probably, I, I would say I didn't curate it, I led it. So it's very much the same thing that's happening here. And um, uh, uh, the participants curated themselves, curated their own story um, and told their own story. And uh, we documented that. And, and, and so that's very much the framework that I see for the New Zealand contribution to this is that, um, uh, you know, to uh, uh, suspend judgment, um, I think that's the biggest, um, biggest thing uh, for white girls is uh, to suspend judgment on, on um, or, I'm, I'm from the fashion, from the fa fashion field. The first thing I do is I look at people and what they're wearing. Um, so I need to just step step back from that and um, and and let people um, express themselves uh, and honor their you know their truth and how they um, uh, they see themselves and how how they value um, value what they're what they're doing and, and create that space for that to happen. So one of the things that happened with that exhibition was that. Um, um, People uh, uh, curated their own uh, uh, image of themselves and that was photographed and the process was documented on film. And then the um, photograph was, public, was um, printed at life size and uh, put on public display in, in downtown Auckland with, with, uh, with over the period that it was over the 30 days that those photos were up, 120,000 people passed there. So, um, so that that process um, had also given people the confidence to be um, be proud of themselves, you know, having that conversation. So I see this as as being that same sort of process as making space for people to be true to themselves and to be proud of who they are and how they're presenting themselves. I think that brings us also to the topic of humbling, you know, the, the making space is also, I mean, I think that's one of my experiences is I've always been so used to you know, taking control, <laughs> taking charge and being convinced of my way is the right way. And I think for me, it's been incredibly lesson or you know learning curve in, in 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 making space and allowing that space then also to show you that your way is not only not always the right way or the especially you know, the only way of uh, of doing things so i think absolutely the humbling has been incredibly um educational i don't know if that's the right word but a learning learning process it, it's really interesting. This has given me a perspective, um, I think, that I've taken for granted from my students' point of view, in that when I ask them to do group work and collaborate, I think all of us, we put them in groups and we set them these tasks and we expect them to just get on with it. And it's like, come on, like, why, why haven't you done this? Oh, I can't do that. I can't work with this person. We're like, come on, you're in university. You should be able to do this. It's so easy, you know. And you forget how difficult it is because even as a designer, as part of a really big design team, essentially you're alone. You get, you know, delegated a task to design or you get delegated key elements from a collection, you know, or you get delegated specific research into a color palette, a trend, et cetera. But essentially you are working alone and then your ideas come together and that's when the clashes happen but also when a collection is born and I think it's quite similar in that it's it's that really chaotic moment and I think that's the beauty of this in that I think something great will be born out of chaos but it takes that chaos and uncertainty to to get to that great thing that's going to come out of it. I think for me, um, my experience with this has also been thinking about my work in a global perspective because I'm very comfortable with presenting my work, you know, in Kenya, in Eastern Africa, in the rest of the continent. But now thinking about it in a global perspective and explaining it in a way that everybody across the world can understand. So that's really helped me expand the ways that I look at my work or talk about my work or explain my work. 
and also seeing the different ways that everybody in the community is conducting their projects because our work is very similar. So learning from, you know, from New Zealand, from Croatia, just the different ways that they are approaching their works and how who they're collaborating with. So it's also really opened up my eyes in different ways that also I can collaborate with others, not only, not only locally within the continent, but even across the world and new methods, new designs that I can also apply in my own works. That's been really eye-opening for me. And I think also there's the self-responsibilities quite different as well because in many of these um, collaborative projects there's always a sort of guideline but here we just I mean it's up to me to to really control what I'm presenting so that's very refreshing and very new and at sometimes um, I have to actually remind myself not to sit back and just wait for the direction but actually be proactive in you know creating um, and presenting our work it's been very interesting and Really, I feel like I've grown also in just the past few months. Yeah. I love how you said that you have to sit back and wait for instructions. I think <laughs> we all kind of like tend to do that sometimes. Okay, who's in charge here? <laughs> oh, right, no one is. <laughs> so, yeah, it's nice and sometimes not nice. <laughs> I think one last uh, topic I would like to address, uh, Erica, if that's okay, before we kind of like invite, you know, all these nice people who have joined us both in the Zoom and maybe on the live stream. But it's the idea of institutional or institutionalized, whatever. So we started this and we don't kind of like exist, right? Um, of course, we created a website and we created whatever uh, uh, social media, whatever platforms, but so it doesn't exist. It's not like a, a registered um, nonprofit or whatever. It's just out there in a cyberspace. And I think that kind of like uh, coexists also with the, the research collective, right? For 10 years, we were basically a network and we didn't really, really existed anywhere. And so that kind of like, um, gives the disadvantage in the sense of applying for funding and, and, and you know, becoming some sort of more of a sustainable structure. But I think on the other hand also, what we have been learning is the advantages of not existing. When we kind of like compare ourselves to initiatives or, or kind of like similar initiatives, but that are, for example, that have received funding and therefore have to um, justify whatever the number of participants or whatever the, the goals they set out to, to, to achieve and then have, having to justify if they did or did not achieve um, those goals. The, the idea of reputation, if you're part of a certain institute or your diversity department, you know, other, other um, stakes are at play, let's put it that way. Whereas we, so the downside is that we don't have any funding and that we're so all doing this in our own so-called free time. But I think I've also come to very much appreciate the advantages, I think, in the last couple of months. And Nana, you were even saying, I hope we don't get the funding because <laughs> then at least we don't have anything to justify. And we can really, really lean into the experiment of again, trying to do this completely decentral. So I don't know what you or if anybody has any opinion on this of being in the margins of being whatever in the borderland, not being an institution without any funding. Um, yeah, and what kind of, I don't know, I guess freedom we buy for that being really able to focus on the content and on the process and not the outcome or the final product. Also, it, I mean, we, I had a very brief funding chat, pre-funding chat yesterday, and it also puts a lot of pressure on you to justify what you're doing in terms of like a monetary product. And that to me takes away from everything that we're doing in a way, because we shouldn't have to justify 
um, or put a value on this amazing exchange of culture and, and design processes and fashion systems and educating in an informal and alternative <laughs> way. So it's quite, when, when someone poses you with all these questions that are targeted to, well, how much money are we going to give you and how much money are you going to give me back? It, it almost takes away all that heart that we've been talking about and all those connections and it, it feels really cold and, and, and alien in a way. And I found myself getting quite annoyed at some of the questions because I just kept thinking, we've come this far without funding. And if we can do it all without funding, that in itself will be breaking a huge pattern of any kind of fashion production in itself, you know. Yeah, it also kind of reminds me the funding applications that we did do and the feedback that we did get, whether it was how we were approaching the idea of fashion. A lot of the funding applications are regional, usually national. So what is it going to bring? So we're not located, right? I mean, the, the assembly itself, we are all individually located, but the assembly is not located. So what is it going to bring to a certain country? You know, as you're saying, like, what are the targets? The fundings, um, funds are usually also uh, focused on, on excellence, right? They want to promote a certain, um, whatever design identity from a certain region or a certain country. Uh, so this idea of excellence, the fact of how we're approaching fashion, how we want to redefine fashion away from the idea of the contemporary fashion. And academic platform, academic and we're not practitioner enough. So also how we kind of like fall in those gaps of how these funding funds um, define themselves or what they are willing to fund and that we don't fit in those boxes besides the fact it's, that we don't have a bank account that's another story yeah. <laughs> but it's the thing that we want we want to sit in those cracks don't we we don't want uh, it, it's that it's that very difficult thing always with um with i think any any funding or any support um, people will only support something they they know and this is unknown and um and and uh you know no one's gonna no one's gonna take take a chance on that you've got to sit in a box you're not allowed to sit in the cracks and we sit in the cracks um we need to find a philanthropist who just says you know you're a great bunch of um uh, people um, here's a big fat check <laughs> you don't need to justify <laughs> how you spend mm. it <laughs> Um, maybe maybe I just wanted to um, ask Leah maybe if she would want to come in here just in terms of what what you may be experiencing because you spoke about that in your in your um, film as well how you sit between art and fashion and academia and practitioners and it's a it's a small community yeah, yeah, definitely can. I mean, I don't know, it's just, I think it's something that comes very natural to, to the way we work in CIMO, that we kind of bridge all these different um, categories or all these different, uh, let's say, positions um, that we kind of uh, try to find a way that uh, really in this kind of a more interdisciplinary dialogue, some topics could be just properly researched. Uh, and I think uh, from our point of view, I think it's also super interesting to uh, be there to support the production of new works, whether it's the, with the designers or with visual artists, because so many times, I don't know, for, for the specific topics that we're interested in, you wouldn't find so easily a grant that could cover um, the production costs or the research. So we're trying to come in there. So maybe we get some funding and then we're able to kind of share it uh, with the community, with the people. I mean, sometimes uh, it's usually through direct invitation to some artists uh, or, or researchers or students as well. We kind of realize that yeah, maybe it's missing out there in the scene and then maybe we could be there as this kind of a facilitator and helping just, I mean, it's bits and pieces of, of funding, but um, I think what happened um, in our case and what really helped uh, our funding, for example, on the local level and being recognized and someone who can maybe fit some boxes, but also this, let this box be relatively open. Like in the creation context, there is, um, uh, there is a specific grant that's called uh, uh, Innovative Cultural Practices. 
and uh, you could apply with all these projects that are maybe not so clearly boxed uh, and you can get a specific grant that are only for the research in these innovative practices. So this is where we found a really good base for our work and which is actually the base of our, of our, uh, our, our center. I mean, there's a lot of volunteer work, but for example, these innovative practices was a really good frame for us to to, to, to get some grants and to be able to, to do our work. Because in the end, with a volunteer, I think you're always so limited. The motivation really falls at, at some point. And no matter how passionate you are about the topics that you research, you really lose it at some point. And I think through time, you just need to find a way to keep your work and uh, your motivation sustainable in a way. So I think also for our research and our, uh, um, uh, let's say, contribution for the Global Fashion Assembly, we were able to secure some of these funding. So for example, we have something ready that we could give to our participants and uh, people that we plan to include in the discussion, we could give them just, it's very symbolic <laughs> fees in the end, but sometimes even the symbolics means it's just kind of a taking this into account that you really treasure someone's time and effort. I hope this made sense. <laughs> Absolutely, I think very recognizable, no? For many of us, symbolic, symbolic <laughs> fees. <laughs> very recognizable. Okay, I don't know, Erica, maybe it's time to open the floor for questions. People want to contribute, participate, express concerns. I'm not quite sure how that live chat works. Um, um, Antoinette, maybe you've figured it out. Um, well, I hope I have. I'm keeping an eye on it. Um, and I've invited the audience to ask questions. So we'll see. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here, for joining us directly in the Zoom. So I don't know if anybody wants to contribute, share, comment. Amanda, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. You're also one of the hosting communities of the assembly. Yeah, I rolled out of bed and came <laughs> very early here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Maybe you want to share some of your experience so far? Me? I typed it into the chat. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, I, I was just saying, you know, it's, it's, I love this format. I, cause it was right around the time you were talking about how um, some people kind of miss the, the sort of concreteness of structure and so then dropped out. And I love that structure, but that also means that certain times that I'm curating an entire reinstallation and managing a major international project, I've disappeared for a, like a month at a time <laughs> and that it makes me feel a little anxious or guilty like I'm not contributing to the team for that that time but I remain committed to the end goal and and I think that that's just a symptom of this kind of grassroots collective um, format and I've certainly generated a lot of interest here in North Carolina because I've pulled in um, at least four artists and community practitioners that are carrying this event off. So it's about me as a curator um, dismantling that power structure and stepping back and just offering a platform. So I think we're calling it mute the dominant mic or something like that, but like we're going to take over the museum space and I'm letting them kind of lead the programming that they want to do so that it's not me always programming that space or deciding the way that voices are represented. Uh, and so we're just doing, we're having a tea of repentance that we're trying. We're having, uh, and that's from Chef Kabui. He's a Kenyan chef that lives in the area, grows a lot of um, African foods, and he's just an amazing um, thought practitioner as well. So he's going to talk about the history of, I think, sugar and rum and tea and how that's related to the, the colonization of the world. Um, and then I'm going to have a beekeeper come and give a, a, a talk and then another one is doing henna, um, Shamora is going to paint our bodies. And then we're also, Alexis Roan is leading it. She's asking people to wear something uh, that is meaningful to them that, that they can then talk about and share with the group. So I, I'm hoping that it's well advertised that people do show up in something that is meaningful and they can wear whatever they want, whatever makes them feel the most them. Um, so we want people to feel as um, much their individuality uh, as they can, while also coming together to share that with other people to kind of 
um, create collective voices and collective experiences. So it's a, it's a different kind of format than the museum would normally do too. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I was in the middle of way too much to try to get a video together for today. I'm so sorry, everyone. Uh, it's right around the time when all of the text is due for the reinstall, which opens in October. So. No, no need to apologize. No, thank you for sharing your experience. And I think that's maybe also an advantage of working in a collective that some people, you know, don't have the time that others can take, take on. And so. Yeah, and then Thank other you. times I might have I more time. You know, it's it's sort of like some people have more time at one point, others don't. And this has been a fallow time for me, but I'll be less busy next month. <laughs> Any questions, comments of the people who are joining us? No, I think we can... there was a question in the chat about where um, people can keep up with what we're doing and um, when the conferences. So I've listed the uh, website and there's a newsletter sign up there where we'll start updating as we get closer to the process. And you can also follow us on Instagram. Now that you mentioned it, I forgot to show the last slide where all that information <laughs> is shared. <laughs> Thank you, Antoinette. Any last thoughts or ideas that you would like to share? Mm. Angela? Yeah. Mm. Thank you, and and thank you, thank you to everybody. Um, I was just, um, you know, thinking just more broadly, like how our workshop today are coming together, and and in the banner of the um, Arte State of Fashion um, conference as ways of caring. How do we practice solidarity? And I think. Uh, by welcoming everybody into this dialogue, by welcoming everybody into sharing and creating a space um, that is sometimes challenging and sometimes rewarding and sometimes about learning and unlearning. So how do we practice solidarity, um, particularly in within this system of fashion, uh, which has has erased so many people. I think that's what I was hearing um, with all the presentations, um, how this is kind of like a rescue work. It's almost like we need to we need to go back, we need to protect, we need to make visible, we need to voice the, these other kinds of histories that have been erased or forgotten or silenced or overtrodden. Um, so how do we practice solidarity and how do we practice decoloniality? Um, in listening, in humbling, in coming to host one another. Um, and so this very generous space um, that we're proposing through the Fashioning Assembly, um, I think is a, is a beautiful way to maybe start the 24 hour online state of fashion, ways of caring and practicing solidarity. Um, I thought if anybody would like to just close with a few words um, and then they have asked if there could be a five minute comfort break um, before their next session because I think from ours it goes on to the next we hand the button over in the live stream so we're suggesting a five minute comfort break um, before the next um, live on stream so we've got about two or three minutes to go if anybody would like to say a few closing words Um, I, one thing I would just like to say is um, I, I'm um, just really delighted to be um, to be part of this or to um, have the opportunity to um, bring New Zealand to this because I think one of the things that um, that we need to remember in all of this is um, 
the, uh, the, the, I suppose, the uh, celebration of other ways of being, you know, that this is a platform to celebrate the other ways of being. So to make heroes of um, the way everybody in the world dresses. We all dress, every day we all dress. And, uh, and and we're not always in the fashion magazine, but but to um, to elevate the um, to elevate the self, whoever that is, wherever that is in the world. And I think this is a um, um, yeah, just uh, from I see this as a platform to do that to uh, to show off everybody. Thank you, Doris. I don't know if I can speak from my positionality, I think, as from the dominant um, side of the colonial difference. I think for me, solidarity is mainly creating space, is um, silencing my own voice in order to make space, create space for other voices that, as you say, have been silenced for so long. And therefore, the, the, the practicing of decoloniality is very, very different for very different positionalities, uh, depending on where you are in relation to the colonial difference. So I never will never forget Rolanda's words when I asked him, but you know, what is my role? What should I do? How can I be, you know, of use? And he basically said to be at service of the community. So the space, I think, for the collective, or let's say for me, as part of the collective, is, is facilitating, is creating this space for all these different communities to meet and silencing, or not silencing, but making space, allowing. I think Antoinette wanted to say something as well. Don't know if she, Antoinette. Oh yes, um, I was just going to say, I think when we think about decoloniality and practicing that and practicing solidarity, we have to think of it beyond trends. Like we have to think of it beyond hashtag activism. Decoloniality is really popular at this moment in time for various reasons, but it should continue beyond that. And really it's so much more than again, the sort of hashtag activism, what we're really trying, or we should be trying to work toward is the disruption of these systems. Um, and I feel like when we're talking about um, continuity and solidarity and shining the light on uh, people who have not been recognized within multiple systems and histories and dress practices, we really have to think about how can we make that have longevity and to, towards accomplishing a goal? You know, like hopefully we won't need to have these discussions forever because at some point we would like to see that change, but it is something that we need to think about beyond trends and the right thing to say at the right time and to have the courage to say it when it's not the right time or the right thing to say. I really agree with that. It's really funny you say about the terminology. I'll just say really quickly, maybe this is for another time, but um, I do a whole thing about terminology and how like we don't want decoloniality and decolonization like the hashtag to be treated the same as hashtag woke, woke design, you know, woke this, woke that. And then um, I do a whole lecture about it and it's, it's really interesting. You don't, we, we, we really don't want that to be the case. And like you said, Antoinette, I think it's really important to remember why we're here, what we want to achieve, and that it's something that's timeless and not just because it's in or on trend now, you know? So I think that's really important. Thank you, Doris. Um, thank you so much. Then I think we will give people their, what was a comfort break? I think you called it. Erica. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, for sharing. And hopefully, yeah, thank you so much for being in this process of trying to organize an assembly. But I'm very much enjoying the process. <laughs> Let's keep focusing on.
through. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for the people joining us directly in the Zoom and on the live stream. And, and, and good luck for the next, what is it, 23 hours then. Hang in there. Thanks, everyone. Bye.